I'm going to change the subject and I'm going to talk about today. Today, we're very fortunate to uh, have Arlene Myrer, who many of you may know. She has uh, been very involved in the community here, not just in the Jewish community, but in general in the community in Arizona. And I have been fortunate to know her and her husband, Steve, through the Smile on Seniors programs that we do. Arlene is an interior decorator, a travel consultant for Playbill Travel in New York. She has been going to India since 1990. In fact, uh, 30 years that is taking groups without compensation just because she loves the country, its people. She has spoken to uh, several groups on the Jews of India, including Hadassah in the West Valley, and has even taken some of those members from the Hadassah of the West Valley on one of her tours. Her last tour that she plans on doing is actually in 2021. And she would like to thank her husband, Steve, for some of the slides that you'll be seeing today and for the PowerPoint. And again, like I mentioned, if you do have a question during the presentation, you can either type it in the chat, I'll be monitoring that, or if that doesn't work, um, definitely unmute your mic and Arlene has a lot to share and of course, only a limited amount of time. So I'm going to spotlight Arlene and um, I am gonna be sharing the PowerPoint. So if you have any issues, speak up. <laughs> And let's uh, get this started. Arlene, you can already uh, share and talk. Okay, do you want to you want to show the first? Okay. It is said that the Jews in India go back to ancient times. Judaism was one of the first foreign religions to arrive in India. Hinduism dates back to about 950 BC, and their Rig Veda, a collection of Hindu hymns, was composed between 1700 to 1100 BC. Whereas the traditional view of Judaism is that the Torah was given to Moses 3,000 years ago. Indian Jews, you can go to number two, Rabbi. Indian Jews, Rabbi, okay. <laughs> Indian Jews have always been a very small minority in a country of over a billion people. The one thing that they never experienced was anti-Semitism in India and even incorporated some Indian traditions in their lives. Some Jews state their ancestors arrived in India during the time of the kingdom of Judah. Others say they're descendants of the 10 lost tribes. In the 1940s, the Jewish population peaked at around 30,000 and began to decline after 1948 when, and when people started to return to Israel. When I first got to South India, number three, Rabbi, um, there were approximately 25 families in Jewtown. This is the synagogue in Cochin, a very famous synagogue. We now call Cochin Kochi. In 2015, there were six Pardesi Jews remaining. When I first got there, there were 25 families in 1990. Kochi or Cochin has one of the oldest active synagogues in the Commonwealth of Nations constructed in 1568. The Commonwealth includes 54 states, including Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and many African countries. If you go to the next two slides, you'll see what the synagogue looks like. Okay, this there are the Torahs that are very famous, and the Belgian lights are in the next one. Keep going. Okay, these are now these are electrified. In the old days, these were you know done with candles and oil, whatever. But uh, they still saw hold services there every week. Uh, they won't let you, you have to sort of make an appointment out again. And it's funny because now the Muslims are selling carpets in most of the houses that were once owned by the Jews. Okay, there are seven Jewish groups, not including expats and, re and recent immigrants. And let's go to the map of India. We'll go to the next one. Okay, this is India. And mainly we're going to be talking about where the Arabian Sea is, the Bay of Bengal and around Delhi. So we can go to the next one, Rabbi. Okay. The Jews of the Malabar Coast, which is Bombay, Bombay, including the Jews of Kochi are one group. The Chennai Jews, formerly of Madras in the state of Kerala, which is south. Sephardic, came from Sephardic, were from Spain and Portugal, arriving in the 16th century after the expulsion during the Inquisition. The third group is the Nargacoil Jews or the Syrian Jews, Arab Jews who arrived in 52 AD in the state of Tamil Nadu, which is southeast. Most were merchants. Many descendants moved to Kochi and then Israel. 
the Jews of Goa, which is on the coast above around Mumbai, Portuguese Jews that also fled with the Inquisition, the B'nai Israel Jews who resided in Karachi, which was part of India until partition in 1947 when it became Pakistan. They fled to India, mainly to Mumbai, formerly Bombay and Israel. There are several synagogues in Mumbai. Some are temporarily closed. There is a Chabad. Here you can go to the next slide, Rabbi. Next, the gateway. Okay. Uh, some are temporary. There is a Chabad and an Ork. I'm sure we all remember the horrific terrorist attack November 26th to 29th of 2008. It was carried out by Lashkar Itaba, a military and Pakistani group, but orchestrated by an American born of Pakistani origin, David Headley. Look him up sometime. He orchestrated this whole thing where these terrorists came in on the Arabian Sea here and attacked the famous Taj Hotel, which you're looking at in the picture here. Um, and a friend of mine died in this. She was a writer for the Times of India. She was there writing and was asphyxiated by the smoke. And so the whole upper portion was burnt by the terrorists. And we stay in this hotel. It's the best hotel in Mumbai, really. Uh, the next group was Baghdadi Jews who lived in Surat. Now that's Northeast, Guj Gujarat. And it come, they came from Iraq, Iran, and Afghanistan. Then there were the B'nai Manash Jews who live in Manipur and Mizrim, which is in the Northeast. Then the B'nai Ephraim Jews, Telugu Jews in Andhra Pradesh, which is Southeast. And we have the Delhi Jews, mainly expats, diplomats, and a small group that are in Parhaganj. Right, let's go through a few more of these slides here. We can go through the gate, go to the gateway of India next. That, this is also Mumbai. And this was built for the Queen of England who never came and the King, and it's called the Gateway to India. But this is where the terrorists came in on the water here and attacked right behind and the whole area down there. Okay, go. you can go to the next one. Okay, now we're in Delhi. The Delhi Jews, mainly expats, diplomats, a small group that are in Parhar Ganj. Now Parhar Ganj is where the backpackers come in. I've regularly visited this synagogue, which is Judah Hayim Synagogue. There's no rabbi, but the congregation conducts services that I have attended during the Holy Holidays. Chabad also has a synagogue in South Delhi, which I didn't know, but I have not been to visit it. I just found that out doing my research. You can do the next two or Judah Hayim. I always take the group there when we go. Most people ask to go. The next one too. Okay, that's inside Judah Hayim. Over 70,000 Indian Jews now live in Israel, over 1% of Israel's population. Of the re remaining 5,000 in India, the largest Jewish community is in Mumbai, where 3,500 have remained. The Sassoons, who I'm sure you've heard of Sassoon, are a very famous Mumbai family, or Bombay. Over 30,000 registered in the 1940s, mainly B'nai Israel and Baghdadi Jews. Pune, which is outside of Mumbai, has both Ohel David Synagogue, one of the largest active synagogues. I have not been there, I have not been to Pune. This is not far from Mumbai in the home of the Ashro, Osho Ashram, which many Jews I'm sure have visited or attended. Some famous Jews of Indian descent are Eli Van Mechahim, an Israeli politician, Jacqueline Babha, a Harvard lecturer, and many Bollywood actors, playwrights, sculptors, and community leaders. Next one. Shalom. Okay. As Bollywood actors, as I mentioned, were first used in the movies, and there's something you should all see. This might be one you want to do, Rabbi, called Shalom Bollywood. This is the unsold story of G Indian cinema. The, in, the Indian women could not expose their arms in the old days. So when I first got to India, they couldn't even kiss in the movies. Now, they, of course, it's different. And so the Jewish women were the first stars in the Indian movies, and they could expose their arms. And this is a documentary. It's all about the actresses Nadira, Pamela, also who was a Miss India, Solo Chana, to name a few, played roles in these very famous movies in the old days. It is said that India is the most colorful country in the world. The hosp hospitality is like Jewish hospitality. The next one with the um, number 
14. Okay. I remember when this man put his hand on my shoulder. This is my girlfriend's uncle. He's dead. And he said, this was in 1990. He said, you're not a guest in our home. You're a member of our family. It is said that it is the most colorful in the world. And it has some of the best hotels, if not the best hotels in the world, the Overright chain. We can go on, Rabbi. This is Mr. Overright. He died at 103. The woman behind me on my left is my best friend in India. She's part of the royal family of Udaipur. Her mother and father divorced and she came to Delhi and her mother became head of housekeeping for Oberoi and took care of him until he died at 103. Our Travel and Leisure magazine said in 2017 and 18 that it was the best hotels in the world. Uh, he was a very personal friend and his, his properties are amazing. If you ever get a chance to stay in one, you are treated royally. Okay, so I, I was friendly with these people and they were in the travel business and this is how it all started. I got to Agra, which is home of the Taj Mahal. Next one. Now oh, this, oh, this is the Oberoi Hotel. This is the Oberoi Hotel in uh, Mumbai, in Bombay. And go to the next one, Rabbi. This is the Oberoi Hotel in Udaipur, which is a new hotel, but this was considered the best hotel in the world at one point. Okay, next. Okay, this is one of my groups. Okay, I'm gonna show you some of my favorite hotels before we get to Agra and the Taj. This is one of my groups way back when it was in 92. This is my favorite hotel in the entire world. And Steve and I have been very blessed. We've been to seven continents and about 130 cities. This is Umaid Bhavan. The Maharaja lives in the back. Actually, if you Nick Jonas and Priyanka Chopra just got married here. They do many movies here. Um, President Clinton and his daughter always stay here and Steve and I have stayed here. It's fabulous. Go to the next one. It's the same thing. Amazing. Never saw things like this, right? People have no idea what's in India. Go to the next one. These are some more. This is Lake Palace. Also the Maharaja's Summer Palace, which is a hotel. I've stayed there. Go ahead. My group has stayed there. This is where we stay now. It's called City Palace in Udaipur. And we literally stay in the back where the Maharaja lives. This is just an idea of some of the beauty of India. That's why when I take people, I take them north first. So they can't tell me, oh, the poverty, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, I got to India in 1990 to go see our famous Taj Mahal. Rabbi. Okay, there she be. Um, this took 22 years to build. And if you know, it's a mausoleum to a, um, a mogul emperor and his wife. He built it for her because she bore him 14 children in 19 years and died out in the field when he was in battle. And he promised to build her the most beautiful building ever built to love. He didn't plan to be buried in there, but he is. Now, Muslims are very symmetrical. That's why you'll notice the minars where they, the minarets on each side where they call to prayer. Well, on the right is a guest house and on the left is a mosque. And on Fridays, the Muslims pray here and it's closed to tourists. But I have been in and they are just like Jews and you'll realize this, the Muslims, you'll go in and you'll see tombs on the top. They're not buried there. You go down below, which you can't go anymore. There's duplicate tombs, they're not buried there. They're buried in the ground, seven feet below the ground. In India, they wash the body. The Muslims wash the body, put it in a white shroud and put it directly into the ground. If that doesn't sound familiar to you, I think that's what we do in Israel, but I'm not sure. Anyway, I got to Agra to see the Taj in 1990. And I got there during a Hindu holiday when they were throwing rocks and they were a little drunk. And I was told, don't go out of my hotel. So six months later, I was so fascinated. I had some money. I was decorating houses, selling them and running Lomans in New York. And I said, okay, I'm going to go back to this country. So I paid for two rooms and I took a guy around who knew all about India. So I went from north to south and I got to know everybody in travel. I got back to Agra and was invited. This is Agra. Um, I was invited to his brother's child's birthday party. And I started going back and the LIU, which is the investigative unit, started investigating me. What are you doing here? So I have a friend, his name is Avar, Amar Dev Swani. I literally call him the godfather because he gives favors to the police and they favor him. He said, bring groups. I never had any plans of doing it. I didn't do it for any. If I did this for money, I'd have to have a special visa. I do it to share my love. 
Okay, I want to share my love for India, its hospitality, and show people the beauty in this country. And if anybody's been in our home, they know I'm immaculate. My house is immaculate. For 30 years, I've been escorting groups, and hopefully with a vaccine, I will return soon. In late September of 2021, I will escort my final group. I'll be 79 by then. I think that's enough. This year's trip and next year's escorter trip have been combined due to promises I made. Last year, I took my doctor. He said it was the best trip he ever went on. He didn't want to go. And he's going back next year. So I promised to take him south. And the people that can't go this year north, I'm adding a week on for the north. This is a voluntary activity. And I want to share my never ending experiences. I've been blessed by Mother Teresa, taking the actress Molly Ringwall around. I ran into her one day. She said, you sound like you know how to shop here. And if anybody knows me, I'm a shopper. So I took her around. Every day I get a message, a call, a gift, a poem, or a picture from someone of my Indian friends that I have met over these 30 years. Everyone smiles in India. And we'll show you a picture of that. <clears throat> now, oh, this, go, okay. This is how these little kids, just look at them. No matter how rich or poor they are, everybody smiles. They feel how they act in this life will take them to the next life. If you go back to the last two, uh, this is in my former days, and this was about in, I don't know, 2013, it says on the rickshaw. Um, everybody in Agra knows me. I'm the only one. I used to spend from two to five months. I had terrible arthritis, couldn't walk in New York. People went to Florida. I went to India. It has the same weather as Arizona. Identical. Hot, hot, hot dry until now when you have monsoons. So I purchased these rickshaws and gave them to, to a Muslim man so that he could earn money to take children to school. I gave him three of these, but he used to get in trouble with drugs and I don't know what he did. So I don't think any of them still exist, but I have bought three of these over the years to help. And I usually go to missions of charity, Mother Teresa, and I do volunteer work when I can. I said, do ask me anything, but don't ask me for religious items, I'm Jewish. So I go there and I teach English as a second language because at one time I was a teacher and I get them linens or do whatever. I go visit the Down syndrome, the learning disabled. Anyway, that's my life. This and they wrote an article in the newspaper, the Chachi for America is in love. Okay, Agra's Taj, Chachi means older auntie or group leader. There are a million hawkers because this is the home of the Taj Mahal trying to sell you things. And if you're a chachi or a group reader, they don't want to sell you anything because they know you're not going to buy anything. So you say, I'm a chachi and they leave you alone. But chachi means older auntie and that's my nickname. I'm the only Agra chachi that lives in India and has for two to five months a year. Anyway, I remember getting to India when I got there and climbing up a hill and this upset me and I'll let Rabbi show you the next, the next one, I think. Keep going. Now that's the trip, that's our last trip. We'll go to that later. Go down to the bottom to the, let me tell you what number they are. Um, 20, 33 and 30, yeah, 33, okay. Do you notice what's on the front of this Hindu temple at the top of a hill? See the swastika? Rabbi, can you get your arrow down here? I don't know, we lost it. Down on the wall, down, down, down right there. Okay, the next one, next one. It's also on, you can see it on this wall in one of, in Mysore. Anyway, the Hindus were the ones that had the swastika. I mean, the earth, the sun, the star in the universe. Only Hitler took it and we all know what he did with that. Anyway, does anybody, um, let's go back to, uh, well, we'll do it last. Okay, let's go back to the one with the house, Rabbi, which is, keep going, which is number, keep going. Keep going, keep going. But, whoops, you got it, there it is. This is the second most expensive house in the world. Its name is Antia, okay? It's the residence of Mukesh Ambani in Mumbai or Bombay. He's an industrialist. It costs $2 billion to build. It's 27 stories high. It's 400,000 square feet and there's a staff of 600. In 2014, Forbes said it was the most expensive billionaire's home. Does anybody know the most expensive home in the world? Anybody know? Does anybody know? You want to take a guess? Rabbi, is everybody on? Yeah, I, I don't, I mean, if anyone does have a guest, unmute your mic. 
Jerry, I see you're trying to talk. Try again. Unmute. Buckingham Palace. You got it. You're right. Which is 500.4 billion, has 770 is 828,820 square feet. Now you call, now you know why we call it Incredible India, but this is what I'm taking a group to this year, Rabbi. We can go back to the back here. Okay, so this, we're going to go to the back waters, which the people actually live on these waters in the middle. Keep going. And we stay overnight on a houseboat and they actually cook food for us. And along these, these little islands that you see, the kids go to school on there and the people farm on there and whatever. Keep going. And we go all the way to the bottom. That's a church. Keep going. This is where we go. We go out to where the three oceans meet. The Bay of Bengal, the Arabian Sea, and the Indian Ocean. And this is a temple. It's Swami Vinagaranda's memorial. And it's called the Rock Temple. It's out in the middle of the oceans. That's where we're going to be, hopefully, next September after the Jewish holidays. September of 2021 for my last group. And anyway, if anybody has any questions, I'll try and answer them. I can't guarantee. Anybody have any questions? Ravi, I can't see anything. Are you getting anything? There you go. Sorry about that. So I'm going to stop sharing the uh, slideshow. If anyone has any questions uh, specifically about a slide, we'll bring it back up. Um, but please do uh, either unmute your mic if you have a question about India and the Jews in India, or if you have a question about India in general. Um, and Arlene will be able to answer as best as try to answer. Hi, this is Andrea, yeah. and I have a question. Arlene, I thought I heard you say that the swastikas were um, first in India, and then they were used by Hitler, but were they, uh, what was the significance or the meaning when they were um, developed in India? Okay, when he had it, it was straight up. If you saw it, it was perfectly angular. Hitler turned it around to the sign. To the Hindus, it means the all-encompassing. The earth, the star, the suns, and the universe. So Hitler took it and I, turned it I'm on its side. To, uh... Thank you. Very interesting. Yeah, people don't know that. I was shocked. I ran to the library. There's a historical library, and I ran to the library. I said, why are all these swastikas on the temples? And I was offended when I got there in 1990 till I found out that Hitler took it from the Hindus. The Hindu is the mm. oldest religion in the world. I think the Hindus also use that. So. Mm. <clears throat> Don't the Zuni Indians and okay, the I was, I was wondering... Hold on, I hear uh, Jerry, are you speaking? Yep. Yeah. Don't the Zuni Indians have a symbol very similar to the swastika? The Indians put this, the swastika came from the Hindus, okay? The Nazis took it and turned it on its side and made it the symbol for their Aryan race or whatever for the Nazis. Hitler yes. took it from the Hindus. The Hindus had it first, which meant the all-encompassing. How did the Indians in the Southwest get that? I can't hear you. How did the Indians in the Southwest, in New Mexico, get that symbol? The Indians in New Mexico? Yep. The Zunis, yeah. I believe, that. Zuni, Zuni, Zuni. They, it all came from the Hindus. So don't ask me where anybody took it, but it originated in India. I just wanted you to know that. I don't know. I have um, I have an answer since, you know, Google is very kind to us. So <laughs> if we listened on Monday for critical thinking, someone should check another source afterwards. Um, but this is what it says. One of the oldest symbols made by humans, the swastika, dates back some 6,000 years to rock and cave paintings. Scholars generally agree it originated in India. With the emergence of the Sanskrit language came the term swastika, a combination of su or good and asti to be, in other words, well-being. The swastika was a widely used Native American symbol as used by many Southwestern tribes, most notably the Navajo. Among different tribes, the swastika carried various meanings. To the Hopi, it represented the wandering Hopi clans. To the Navajo, it represented a whirling log, a sacred image representing a legend that was used in healing rituals. Um, and that, that last paragraph I just read is from Wikipedia. Good, that embraces them to put it all together. We got it all in one thing. And here is what it says. The history of the swastika goes back to the origins of the Eurasian continent. The swastika is an important symbol in Hinduism and Buddhism, among others. 
and was also used in Native American and Jewish faiths, which is interesting, yeah. prior to World War II. By the, early, by the early 20th century, it was regarded worldwide as a symbol of good luck and auspiciousness. So that's just some interesting information. Yeah. It's, it's um, but Jerry th and Andrea, you know, good, good points over there. Uh, Elaine, did you have a question? No. Okay. I do. Hello, oh, I'm with Joel. Go ahead, Joel. Um, when we lived in Israel, our very dear friends were from uh, India. And Isaac had been an Air India pilot uh, with his, and his wife had been a teacher. And um, they called themselves Ben David and they were from the Bombay area. Yeah. Um, are you familiar with that? Yeah, but I have not been, I tried to get over to, after the, the bombings, I tried to get over to the Chabad to make a donation and they wouldn't let me go. I haven't been back in Mumbai in many, many years, probably about eight years. I only get there when I go to the South. I am going next year, so I will try and find out more. I'd like to go and visit the, some of the synagogues if I can in Mumbai. I don't know if I'll have time when I have a group and most of my group last year is not Jewish. Usually I have a lot of Jewish people. <clears throat> Next year's group, I already have eight people going, and none of them are Jewish, so except for myself. So I, I will try to get to the Chabad at least. I don't know. I have so met the rabbi of Mumbai. Arlene, Arlene, just to jump in, the Ben David group live in Mumbai? That's what... That's yeah, I believe so. Okay. So you're oh, saying they God. have their own synagogue there, but you haven't been able to visit that part? No, I, have, I haven't visited any of the synagogues in Mumbai. I'm never there long enough. I only go to Mumbai for a day or two and then I leave, but I live in North India. So I go to Delhi all the time. So for me to do anything in Delhi, it's three hours from Agra, three to four hours. That's easy. But Mumbai is a long distance away. And when I have a group, I can't go running to do these things. You know, if I had a Jewish group that wanted to go to the Jewish sites in Mumbai, I would do that. But right. this time I don't have that. It depends what I have. I usually have a lot of Jewish ladies and they all want to go to the synagogue. So I always take them in Delhi and we make a donation. So, Joel, we're going to have to get the answer to you in a year. Okay. <laughs> I can't they promise were... you because I don't know how much time I'll have to get anywhere. I would like to get to the Abad. That's the one thing I want to do. So, they uh, had darker skin and they were very tall, both of them. Oh, wow. <laughs> so they were, they were not like the Jews of Cochin who had lighter skin. This was a, a whole different group. Yeah, well, I, you know, I, I met a lot of the Jews of coaching when I first got there in 1990. Most of them were professionals. Most of them were doctors and lawyers, but uh, they're all gone. I mean, there's just a few couple of Jews that it, all the Muslims and the non-Jews well, were selling the Jewish items in the, in the <laughs> shops. Well, this one was a, this one was a uh, Indian fighter pilot. Oh, well, I don't know many of those. The, he taught the uh, head of the Indian Air Force how to fly. Oh, oh, they, wow. I'll tell you, the one thing they do in India better than anything else that they do is their military. Sure. In January, in mid-January, they have a parade. It's the Republican. You have never seen anything more orchestrated per perfectly. I mean, they have all, every unit of the army, the Navy, everything, flying guys on motorcycles. Amazing. It's the most amazing parade you can ever see. Yeah. I haven't been there for a while, but it, it's totally, that's the thing they are most organized about, their military and their mm. divisions of the Army, Navy. Yeah, well, he flew against the uh, Pakistanis during right. their war. And uh, he was uh, he was my best friend there at LL. Yeah, they're, they're wonderful people. Really, it's just, you know, I, the hospitality, when I first got there, I used to see Hebrew writing on the way to the Taj. I said, what's going on here? But the Israelis, a lot of the Israeli kids come over, they buy a motorcycle, they go straight across India, they go all over India, and then they sell the motorcycle. So they eat in these vegetarian restaurants and they have to, you know, they show them all this Hebrew on some of the buildings. I don't know if it's still there, I haven't looked lately. <clears throat> Rabbi. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Sheldon. Uh, Last two years ago at the Honor Health Gym, an Indian doctor who lives and practices in Scottsdale brought his parents over from a little village outside of, I don't know where in India, but they were Hindus and 
uh, the father was a doctor and he was 91 years old. He was, he looked like he was 50. <laughs> and uh, his wife wore sari to the, to the exercise class. He didn't, but she did everything. And they brought him over for a month and I corresponded with him. I don't remember where he lived, but I sent him something for some Indian holiday. But he was in such great shape and his daughter-in-law who is married to the doctor here in Arizona said that you have to remember he's Hindu so he eats no meat. He's not supposed to eat it. They allowed him to eat it. Yeah, go ahead. He, he probably is a vegetarian. Yeah. yeah, but he said he's a vegetarian uh, and he walks everywhere because they don't have a car. Right. They, walk, they walk to get food every day. They walk during torrential storms to go to the gym there's a gym, but it's not air conditioned. His son put air conditioning in their house, uh, who lives here in Arizona, because most people there do not have any air conditioning. And uh, he was just a lovely man. But well, you know, now you know what I what I love, learned to love. I eat in a Muslim home six nights a week. My friends, and they're not Arabs, they're Muslim, okay. have grown up with me as a Jew and their kids have grown up with me. They're 30 years old. I've been to all their weddings wow. and they, they have taken care of me since I got there in 19. I like meat. Unfortunately, um, I'm a meat eater and they halal their meat. So believe me, they're very, very tough about this. But I, they know I like my boti roti. Boti is meat and roti is the bread. And they have taken care of me for the last 30 years and I take care of them. I, that's why I do the group so that he could afford to marry off his daughters and he is taking my groups and everybody loves this, the people, he does my tours. He has a master's degree in economics. And we I became met, uh, friendly with them when my passport was stolen. Go ahead. We had met a couple, two retired school teachers who went to India and in they were probably in their late seventies and one of them fell off an elephant, went for an <laughs> elephant ride. I never but heard of she went to the hospital and the doctor she had there was trained at, uh, in New York. He did his residency in New York. So she had a good recovery. Uh, I don't said, know how you fall off an elephant because we walk up and we sit on a chair and we're in a bar. We have a bar around us when we're in it. She fell off, she said, and broke something. And the doctor there in the hospital trained in New York and she was fine. <laughs> oh, good. No, it's, yeah, they have wonderful, you know, look at the doctors here. We have all these Indian doctors. Yeah. Thank you, Sheldon. Um, Charlie, did you have a question? Uh, no, it's it's been <laughs> it, never mind. Okay, if you uh, come back up with something, just uh, let us know. Lou, you had a question. Uh, is it is it an expensive country to visit? Yeah, it is. You know, when I first got there, I should have bought a house. Okay, I could have bought a house for probably twenty thousand dollars in Agra. It's now a million dollars. Okay, uh, hotels, those Oberoi hotels that you're looking at. That, you know, they can be anywhere from like, off season, maybe 400, but up to a thousand dollars a night. That's why we stay in palaces and whatever. And I get a special deal because of my connections, but it's, it's not expensive so much to eat. Although it's some comparable to what we have here, but it's, it's expensive and it's expensive for them. I've watched everything go up, up, up. And it's just amazing. I don't know how they survive because it's, they, tuna fish is more money in India than it is here. If I want to buy a can of tuna fish, Cost me more in India. Peanut butter, more in India than here. So, I mean, there's certain things that are more and there's certain things that are less. Vegetables are fresh. And the Subzi Walla who comes around every day, you buy your fresh vegetables and you cook. And I mean, that that's less expensive. But if you want to buy, you know, especially, they have everything in India now. When I got there, they didn't have anything. They have everything we have here, just about. I used to go like Santa Claus. Here I'm coming with all these presents. And now, you know, I just, I don't bring anything anymore. They can get everything. Elaine, did you have a question? Uh, yes, you said something about Gujarati. I, I, for some reason, I thought it was more south. You said- no, Gujarat is, is up above near Pakistan. It's between above, uh, if you go to Agra and Delhi are sort of like in the middle of the north. If you go to the left, to the east, and over and up a little bit, I have not been to Gujarat, but mm. it's right next to Rajasthan, which is where all those beautiful hotels were that I showed you, right mm. next door. And that's where a lot of the crafts come from and all the beautiful clothing. I'm wearing an outfit today from Udaipur. So, um, 
you know, and that's Rajasthani. And the Gujaratis tend to wear, you know, tend to have similar kind of handicrafts. Right. We actually, um, Lou, did you have another question? I wasn't sure if I interrupted you. No? Okay. Um, I, I learned something here recently. I don't know if you know about this, but it'll be interesting that the Indian rugs that are so expensive uh, that they sell here are actually, um, I'm talking about like Native American, are actually not their own craft in, in a sense that you had foreigners that came and taught them a craft and start selling it. Is that the same thing when you talk about the Indian rugs? No, 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 no. Okay, first of all, let me tell you about carpets because I know about both of them being a decorator. The Indian carpets and Asian Indian carpets are that came from the Middle East, came from over Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, they came across, and those are the good, the Persian carpets, whatever. The silk ones, the most expensive carpets come mainly there, most of the very expensive crafts are done by the Muslims, and they came from what is, you know, where, what, um, where do they have the Himalayan mountains in um, Nepal? The highest highest point in India. I'm trying to think about it. By the way, the highest point in the world, Mount Everest, is over in um, in uh, Nepal, and right next to it, the Himalayan mountains go up into, um, I'm trying to think of the top of India. I can't think of it right now. But um, that's where all your best carpets came from. The part, Kashmir, okay? Kashmir, the Kashmiri carpets and the Muslim handicrafts are the best, okay? They're expensive, they're not cheap, and there are wool rugs that are made in Agra, where I live. A lot of the wool that you see in ABC carpets in New York, those are all Agra wools. Most of them came from Agra, and there are a lot of woolen carpets woven in India right now. As far as what you're talking about, Rabbi, the natives, who they learned it from, I don't know, but they dyed their own yarns, because I have those too, and I, I work at the herd, I volunteer at the herd, okay? They dyed their own yarns and the men used to do that. That's another dyeing craft because a lot of the people don't want to do it anymore. And yeah, but I don't know who they learned it from, but they are big rug people. Unfortunately, they put the cross in their rugs a lot because it's one of their symbols. So if you come into the herd where I volunteer in the shop, you'll see the cross in a lot of their things. I haven't even uh -huh. seen the swastika. I'll have to look for it now. But, um, and another thing, when you go to India, we have Jewish stars all over the place, all over the place, you know, the six-sided star, everywhere. Everybody thinks that the Muslims, you know, put, carry the Jewish star. No, it was just a Muslim symbol, a symbol that came from where they came from and that they brought across from Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, and they brought it to India, but you'll see lots of them. That's interesting. In and fact Muslims will not put pictures on any of their things. They'll use geometric symbols and they'll use flowers, but they will never put a person's face on their buildings or anything. Um, you mentioned about the stars. There's actually a, a standard Jewish question if the Jewish star of David is actually Jewish. Now, not to get into that in the sense of a discussion. <laughs> That's probably another discussion. There's really a question about that. Yeah, I mean, because it is a, you'll see it on, uh, you'll see it on Agra Fort. There's big Jewish stars right on the, on the fort, and it has nothing to do with Judaism. Absolutely zilch. Ar Arlene, two questions that I guess are related to touring. Number one is what injections do you need, uh, meaning to go to India? Are there specific injections that people okay. take for that? I, will I just know that you're talking about the coronavirus injection and as well, I, I, but in, in, in general, I get asked this all the time. And my question is you go to your doctor and everybody should that travels should have hepatitis A and B. One is for food and one is for blood in case you ever need it, the series, okay? I always make sure I have, I'm up on my um, DBT, my dentist, typhoid, whatever, diphtheria. I probably haven't even done typhoid. I was on the plane and I heard people from the American embassy saying, I don't take malaria pills anymore. And I don't know, this must have been 15 years ago and I stopped taking them. I feel, God forbid, by the way, this hydrochloroquine, the famous drug is all over the streets of India. They, they've been using it for malaria and whatever for years. So, I mean, I could have bought it over the counter. My friend said, we can't get any mail to you. I said, I don't want it anyway. But anyway, you, it, you, you should ask your doctor. I take nothing. I don't even take malaria tablets. I do get a cold every time I'm there because some kid has touched something and I catch it. I really don't. I'm just up on my general shots. I don't take anything special. And I drink more water, which I learned from the Israelis, 
in India than I drink here because if you ask and it's filtered and I would only do it in the regular hotels, I drink ice and more water than I drink here. So you're, and you drink it from the tap? No, no, okay. I never brush my teeth with the water. I use bottled water, bottled water, is great, but I drink the water in the hotel. If they give you a pitcher of water with ice, I do drink it if the water is filtered. But that's only in the good hotel. You just ask if it's filtered. Most people have a filtration system. They even get water in jugs now, big jugs, because that was the problem. You pick up these waterborne diseases, so you have to be careful. I tell everybody, don't ever brush your teeth with the water out of a sink. Okay, now you one more, yeah, one more practical question. Uh, someone messaged me privately. Their trip to India in October was canceled. How large is your group in general? Obviously, you're still in formation to a degree. Um, are you looking for more participants? Yes, I How will. How long is the trip and what is the cost? Okay, right now, I can't tell you the cost. They usually are around $5,000, including all your everything domestic. It does not include your international flight. So it costs you about, from here, maybe 6,300 with everything. But that does that's all your breakfast, all your transportation, your air conditioning, these fabulous hotels, which you would usually cost you, you could, two nights you could spend $1,000 on the hotels. Um, you get fabulous hotels and you get a guide, a private guide with you the whole way and I'm with you. I will only take 15. I have, there's six people plus the two of us going right now. So there are eight that have signed up that wanted to go. There's some this year, my doctor's going back. Next year, we have a doctor with us because he said it was the best trip he ever, he didn't want to go. He, he loves to go to Africa. He said it was the best trip he ever went on. I talked him into it. He signed up before he left. He says he owes me a gift. So I said, what I want from you, I want the first vaccine when it comes out. He's, he just wrote me last night. He said, I promised you if it comes out, you'll get it in November, October, uh, December. So we should all be your friends so that uh, you can sign up to be second on the list to get that shot. And by the way, I don't take a penny. There is no commission. You're not paying a travel commission at all. I don't even touch the money. You pay India directly. You, you transfer it from one bank to the other. And if there's no vaccine, you'll get your money back. We're not going, but I don't know. He can't get into the office. The offices are closed. The, there's no planes going. I got candy from somebody a couple of weeks ago because their child got married and there was no wedding. They sent $19 worth of delicious candy on Amazon. I went to write a thank you. I went to the post office. They said, we can't mail it. There's no mail to India. So she said, you can go UPS. It'll cost you a hundred dollars. I said, thank you. I called them on the telephone. So, okay. That was really, that's interesting. So are these hotel, I'm just curious because you said India has similar weather to us or at least where you stay. Do they have air conditioning in these hotels? Everything is air conditioned. <laughs> it's just like, it's no different than here. And the hotels are fabulous. You will never have better treatment in your life than in Indian hotels. Wow. You're treated like a Maharaja or a king. That's their, their thing. Even the person who knew about the people on Air India and El Al, Air India's symbol is the Maharaja. It's how we treat people. Everything is how we treat people. Wow. That's pretty amazing. So first, uh, thank you again. If anyone has any last questions, please uh, don't you. be shy. And uh, Arlene, thank you so much. We really thank appreciate you. this. Just to uh, give everyone a heads up. Okay. Going to, oh, Lori, did you have a question? I, hands up, yeah. You had mentioned the word chat. Chat. And they said that's your nickname. I was wondering. I can't hear it. Uh, Lori, or if I misunderstood that when Agra Chachi. Um, Agra Chachi. Chachi means older auntie. I'm not getting any. Um, Can she hear that? I don't no, know. No, Lori, you're, you're, I think your uh, internet connection word, might be slow. Chachi means older auntie or group. Oh, okay. I was wondering what the word Chachi is. Chachi is older auntie. What? And it means group leader so that the hawkers don't bother me when they're trying to sell to everybody their merchandise, which you don't want to, you don't, you don't talk, you keep walking, you ignore them. You say you're a chachi, they <laughs> leave you alone, they know you're a group leader. But my, if anybody wants to know anything, my email address is A-G-R-A chachi, C-H-A-C-H-I at Hotmail or Yahoo. I don't use Gmail, but I have it there too. So if you want any question, I'll be glad to, you know. I put that in the chat. 
Yeah. Thank um, you. Andrea, did you have a question? Yes, I do. So um, Arlene, you were mentioning how they do their burials, that they wash the body and then they intern them in the ground. They put but it in a large crowd. Yeah. I, I thought that India is a lot Hindu and that it they is. cremate the yeah, bodies. The Hindus cremate, but the Muslims, that's, I'm talking about the Muslims bury that way. The Hindus, they're 79% Hindu, 14.23% Muslim. That's how the Muslims bury in India, just like the Jews. I was talking about at the Taj, because the Muslim emperors were buried like the Jews bury in the ground, down below. Okay, thank you. Very interesting. Yeah, you're very welcome. Um, Arlene, thank you again. This was so informative. And uh, just so everyone knows, in September, we have, God willing, her husband, Steve, is going to share his experience uh, with a trip of the country of Israel, which should be very interesting. Um, he also went there as a volunteer in addition to uh, touring that he's done and stayed some time there. Um, but that's, we've got a month at least. Our September schedule is still in formation um, because we're waiting on the mayor to hopefully present to us as well. Um, so again, Arlene, thank you so very much. This is informative and, and uh, really, really informative. So thank you.